want to make a point about the question we had about our responsibility and how do you answer someone that says, I believe in personal responsibility. To me, who believes in personal responsibility? Who believes in democracy? Who believes in motherhood? It's one of those buzzwords that people feel righteous about if they can cite that as a reason for what they believe. And in that say, Tim talked to us about staying out of the weeds. There's a way in which that question about responsibility drags us into the weeds, and we have to talk about it as if there's a question of responsibility there. The question for me in all of this is, it's our responsibility as a democratic society to come together to figure out problems, and figure out our solution to problems. And there's no way that any of us could get through the day without relinquishing responsibility for a whole host of things as we go through the day. So let's not talk about whether or not we believe in responsibility, or whether personal responsibility is a reason to deny the needs of thousands and thousands of our citizens, and thereby sidestep the question of what is important for us as a democracy. Now, I'm not saying that we answer the question just that way, but it's important, I think, in any of these questions to get back at that fundamental assumption that the question seems to hold. If somebody talks about, well, I believe in their personal responsibility, the assumption is I need to defend my idea of personal responsibility. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It's not a real question. About asking a good question in response to a challenge to you. Oh, if a challenge, I don't mean to answer every question with a question. That isn't what I mean at all. If the legislature asks, well, how are you going to pay for it? I might say I'm really glad to see that you're concerned about cost, because cost is one of my major concerns for coming to universal health care. And all of the examples that we have throughout the world, they've been able to deliver much better care for many more people for a lot less money. And we can talk about that in specifics if you'd like to. Their taxes might go up, I'll agree with that, but the overall cost will go down, and that, I think, is what we're interested in. Just one thing really quickly. I'm kind of, what I try to do with that question about personal responsibility is, if possible, you know, do you kind of like a jujitsu or aikido where you turn things around and go back to reinforcing our main talking points again by turning the question around? And also, you know, remember that we do not have to answer every question or be able to rattle off every specific detailed statistic, but say, simply say, go to our website. We've got tons of information there that documents and proves everything. And so if you can't answer it, you know, don't just make something up or, you know, and train people to say that we've got all this information, go to our website. Right. Tim mentioned earlier, don't get dragged into the weeds. If I'm against what you're saying and I can drag you into the weeds to talk about something that's out of there irrelevant or not right to the point, I'll do that. And if you, and that's a lot of the questions it seems to me will try to do that. Go ahead, Camille. I think it's also important not to say things that you cannot verify, such as your taxes will go up. We don't have an answer to that question until we have a legislation. We need an economic analysis, but we can't make that proposition. We can cite the experience of other countries that have dealt with that. And overall, we experience better care for more people for less money. Go ahead. I have a question about this lobbying effort overall. Are we expected to lobby our own people or other people as well, our own representatives and senators? Well, my immediate answer to that is anyone who will listen to us. That is, if we have a point of view when it comes up, then we can ask that around. Chris may have a, I think we're mainly our own legislators. So my understanding about where we are now on the rally planning committee is that what we want to do is have people in the first instance talk to their own legislators with appointments that are set up ahead of time. But as we get closer, we're going to evaluate where we have coverage and where we don't. 
and then we may ask people if they'd be willing to go and I think we would like to speak to all 90 of the legislators, the 60 representatives and the 30 senators. And, uh, and in, in some cases that will be people from outside the district probably given where our organizing is now. But, um, but in the first instance, yeah, your own legislator. Um, so, so in terms of going to your local group and saying, okay, let's plan, and who wants to go and be part of the delegation that talks to them, because if we get 2,500 people there, we don't necessarily need all those people to go be part of the delegations either. So we're, we're trying to be more organized about it. So when we are um, thinking about training people that are local, one of the things that we might do to start out the event is it's often useful to have a joke. So um, why are healthcare lobbyists so bad at telling jokes, timing? <laughs> so, one job of elected officials is to represent their constituents. Um, so, in order to do that, they need to know what constituents think. One method of allowing them to find out what their constituents think is by lobbying. So, one of the things that you need to remember when you're going to lobbying is you are helping your legislator do their job. We also need to remember that legislators cannot possibly talk to all of their constituents. So likely the time that they're going to be able to devote to you is pretty small. In order to make use of that time well, you want to be well prepared. Um, so an important part of lobbying is the preparation. Um, so why would you lobby? The, the purpose of lobbying? Well, to let your, your legislator know what you're thinking. You might be educating them about an issue. You might be advocating for an issue. You might be identifying support or opposition. You might be trying to move a supporter to become a champion, or somebody who's undecided to become a supporter, or somebody who's opposed to become less opposed, or maybe even to become neutral. Um, so every single person can lobby to educate. There's actually some, for if you're lobbying for advocacy, there's actually some limits. In Oregon, not for much so. I mean, for example, federal employees cannot lobby on federal issues. In Oregon, the only limit is that um, state employees cannot lobby on ballot measures or candidates in their capacity as a state employee. They can do so on their own. Um, and so there's you know, a little bit of rules on how that goes. So essentially, on a bill, everybody can advocate. Um, so when you are preparing to meet with your legislator, one of the first things you want to remember is you need to treat the legislature as if they have the best interests of their constituents at heart, even if you don't think they do. You want to treat them as if they do. Um, there's some obvious things. You want to know your issue. You want to keep your presentation simple. Um, you want to practice, especially if you're nervous about it. It helps to practice. It helps to practice with other people there, and perhaps even role play, as we've been doing a little bit of. Um, you want to plan things about information. Is there information that's useful to send to them before you go? Is it useful to present a handout to them while you're at the meeting? And um, what might be worthwhile as a follow-up? Um, oftentimes, you don't know what's going to be worthwhile as a follow-up until you have the meeting. So you might have to change your mind or have something, um, pre pre prepare something after the fact that is a follow-up. You want to share information with your group after the meeting. So after you've done that meeting, you want to go back and share it with other people who may go lobby, or even if they're not going to go lobby, it's useful to share what you have found out. So you want to share that information. Um, I'm going to emphasize the in the preparation, finding out about your legislator beforehand. Um, now, people don't need to you don't want somebody to decide not to lobby just because they can't be completely prepared. You want to try to encourage them to become as prepared as they possibly can. But you know, if you're not totally prepared, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and do what you're prepared to do. Um, if you're trying to learn about your legislator beforehand, you might want to learn about what's their stance on your particular issue. 
again, are they a champion? Are they a supporter? Are they only lukewarm? Are they undecided? Or are they opposed? Or maybe even they're a champion of the opposition. So you want to have some clue as to um, what they think about your issue. What's the nature of their district? Rural, urban, mixed? Um, what are the major employee, employers in the district? Or what kind of jobs do many of the people in the district have? If that's something that's identifiable. Um, you want to be able to explain to them why your position will help their constituents. What is it about what you're saying that's going to help their constituents? You also might want to find out who are their biggest supporters. What is your position going to do to help their biggest supporters? Um, are they new to legislative life? Are they um, respected senior leaders? Uh, what are their committee assignments? Um, are they on the health care committee or where, whatever they are? Um, if they are Democrats, it might be useful to remind them that the number three issue in the 2014 platform is establish a comprehensive, equitable, affordable, high quality, universal, single payer health care system funded by progressive taxes and open to patient choices of providers. So remind them, that's what their party has said it stands for. If the Republicans, um, you, I've actually put on a document a couple sites of Republicans who have, or Republican leaders who have written good reasons for why Republicans should be in favor of single payer. So you might want to make use of that information. Or you can, or you can legislators. No, these are not. These are actually. Um, they happen to be both of the documents that I found that were pretty good were healthcare providers, who were strong Republicans who said. You know, we got to go to single payer. <laughs> Question: How do uh, representatives in whose district we don't reside, how do they take our request for a, a, an appointment or meeting with them? Uh, generally speaking, legislators will first ex schedule appointments with constituents. <clears throat> then, next in line would be if someone is representing a statewide group, a statewide organization, or an organization that covers their territory, includes their territory. And so it's not a problem scheduling with them, but just remembering that if it's a constituent that calls, they're more likely to get scheduled in quicker. And we should remember that we, we have 97 coalition members that are all over the state, mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> Uh, building on what Charlie was talking about in terms of learning a legislator, one of the areas this comes in very important is when you tell your stories and when we train people to go talk to the legislators, to let them know, to tell their own stories in a way that, will re that that legislator will respond. A lot of times you don't know what will be key triggers for a legislator, but sometimes you do. For example, one legislator might say, if business gets behind this, then I'll support it. And then you can make sure that the stories that are being shared with them back up the fact that this will help business. If someone in the group is a small business owner, they can talk about how it would affect them and why, as a small business owner, they support it. If a legislator has been elected because they are adamantly adamantly opposed to abortion. That's something that you want to know about so that you can take that into consideration when telling the personal stories and sharing stories with them. If they were elected because they were strongly backed by a particular union, maybe they were strongly backed by SEIU. SEIU happens to be a member of this coalition and in support of the measure, so that would be strong information to share with them. But when you, but the most important thing I wanted to emphasize today is what values to the legislator is hearing your reasons why you support it in terms of why it affects you personally and your personal stories. For example, telling them a lot of statistics about what would be good for the country doesn't necessarily persuade them. But telling them about the person you know 
whose daughter died because she did not get the medication that would have cost a few cents a day because they had no health insurance and so they didn't go to the doctor, they didn't get the proper prescriptions and she didn't get that medication. That kind of story is what draws them in. So they start responding to what you're looking for. They want to know why you're there and they want to know why this is so important to you. Some legislators will be of the sort that they don't know that people are out there that don't have health insurance, and so when they start hearing the stories, they start learning a lot more about it. And, and some of them just, they know that there's problems, they know there are issues, they just don't know that this is the best way to go about solving it. So when we go in, and when we train people to be prepared as lobbyists, you want to share with them that the most important thing they can do is tell their personal stories. So you want to help them prepare how to tell those personal stories. And they, if they can tell their personal story in 30 seconds or a minute, that's fantastic. If it takes them a couple of minutes, that's still doable because when they meet with the legislator, you may be, most of the time when you meet with the legislator, most of the time we would probably have groups of four or five people, maybe six, and each person could tell a short story about why it's so important to them. If we have larger groups, then it might not be as easy for everybody to tell a story, but at least some could share a story. I, I, I love what you're doing. I, I, Wholeheartedly. But I have a perspective on this. I've, I've lobbied at Salem twice, 2011 2013. My representative was, was Bob Jensen from Eastern Oregon. Okay. Right. So this is the Eastern Oregon perspective. It's going to be different from all of you else in the rest of the more civilized part of the state. <laughs> I, don't, I don't say that demeaning my, my hometown, but uh, it's just the way it is. This spring, we had a primary election for who's going to replace Bob Jensen. And uh, I like Bob Jensen. He was an independent, then he became a Republican. Well, he was also a former Democrat. But I could talk to him, and he we would trade <clears throat> jokes at the end of the 15-minute lobbying session. And he told me to just joke about Hillary Clinton dying, going to heaven, and finding out that, yes, America will get universal health care, but not in God's lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bob Jensen. He at least would talk about it. He said, follow your heart. This is a good right. on the side of history and all this. But he had never voted for it because <laughs> he said there's no support. Now I was able to speak to the then candidate John Turner, ex USMC battalion commander at my place, Camp Pendleton, back in the day. We shared this bond. He was a Republican, he was a moderate, he was the president of the MCC, Community College in Pendleton. He was considered in cahoots with government by his challenger, who is a Tea Party candidate. Mm -hmm. Guess who won the primary? By a three to one margin. This, is, this, this doesn't presage a good outcome. When I come back to Salem, the next time we submit a bill, and I walk into the office of this guy, instead of a Bob Jensen, I've got a far right wing representative who thinks he's got the mandate of the people because he won the election by 1% or something. You know, he can't mount a good candidate against these kind of guys. And I, what I see happening is that this is happening not just to us, but might happen to more parts of the state than we suspect. And the observation is that in midterm elections, only angry people vote. They come out in droves. It would take a humongous effort by the progressives and the Democrats to, to just maintain the hold you have in Salem and at the federal level. In fact, we're probably going to face a Republican House, perhaps. Since I don't know what the projection is, but I'm saying to you that I don't, over the last four or five years, I don't see our job as getting easier in Salem. Right. Even though we're doing everything right, we've lobbied them, we, we, we get told them our personal stories, we, we practiced our presentations, we met afterwards, compared notes, and collected the data, analyzed it all, uh, got more people to come to the rallies. Even if we do everything we can possibly do and do it well, 
and this meeting is about planning those things. I'm just trying to tell you that we're going to face a harder case on the legislative side. It's, it, to me, it's daunting. Yeah. I, I don't want to discourage you, but I think this is part of the reality of strategic planning. But what you get here is you're not, what, what you're seeing here is when you talk to the legislators, you develop that relationship with them and tell them your stories and the, the people who go to lobby with them, tell them their personal reasons and the stories that connect them. When you connect with the legislator, they then recognize you as a human being and start thinking more about what it is you're saying. The statistics, someone like like the uh, the new representative there who plays Jensen, someone like that, the statistics probably won't convince them because the statistics to them are just something that that's numbers somebody could make up. But the true life story of what's happening to individuals in their district is something that they may respond to. And that's where that connection comes in. I, I think of a a story years ago where, you know, and every time we start talking, every time we start talking about something, we start telling stories, right? That's because they're they're an effective way to get the message across. It was a time years ago I ran into somebody that we were talking, and he was basically saying everyone should be responsible for themselves, and we should not be trying to help anyone lift them lift up because it's really going against nature if you try to help people. You should really just let people drop, die off because Lord then, the you know, we get a better society. And, but the interesting thing was, he was very religious as well. So I used C.S. Lewis against him. And I told him about the writings of C.S. Lewis and the message that basically we need to, as humans, strive to be better than human in order to be closer to God. And so we need to strive to be better than the animals, which means we shouldn't live by the rules that the animals live by. <laughs> that convinced him, <laughs> surprisingly enough. Quick, quick question. How many votes? Just kind of to emphasize something you said about the personal relationship. Nothing is more important. So to capitalize on that, do your work with your legislator before you visit, during the visit, but also after you visit, because that relationship will have to build over time, not just when you're in the office, thank you, goodbye, I'll see you next year. So that time between now and next year to keep that relationship up is so important. This time I heard a story about someone in North Carolina legislating about the death penalty who changed someone's mind, and the reason she was given by her legislator was, you kept talking to me. Yeah, that's a good point. And building that relationship is one of the things to think about is you don't want the legislator when they are looking at the issue, thinking about, well, my neighbor's cousin's sister's babysitter lives in Canada and comes down from Canada to get treatment because there's too long of a waiting list in Canada. Somebody that they don't even know, somebody that might not even exist, but they heard this story and so it sticks with them. But what you want them to be thinking about is, Susan, who came into my office, had trouble getting health care because of the system we have now. I need to fix this for my constituent, Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, Frank's observations about Eastern Oregon. And I don't know the data, but I would imagine that the demographics are such that there are a lot of poor people there, there are a lot of people who are suffering, there are a lot of people who are unemployed, a lot of people who don't have services. And I should think that if we, ha we had the capacity to develop that kind of research where we you know there's conservative opposition, we can describe a picture where those constituencies are going to be better off. I mean, this is essentially what happened in, in the Depression. I mean, there was a lot of opposition to New Deal programs, but the people needed them. And I would imagine that there may be a silent majority out there who would be in favor of programs that would support their welfare. Now I'll just close with you. You often find a lot of times these very conservative legislators, even though they may say that they don't support the position, 
they want to help constituents in their district to improve their lives as well. And so if they get a story from someone who's living in their district and is having problems because of these, uh, this, the way the healthcare system is structured, they will then start trying to think of, well, how can we improve that? And well, maybe this is an option we need to look at. Thank you very much. As one Toastmaster to another, he knows that it's time to cut things off. And we can, and our next section is for 30 minutes. And if we, if we not do the question and answer, we can get the 30 minutes and continue on. And so let's do the, the, the 30 minutes right now for, for the role play. Do, do you have a model for us, Charlie um, and Jim, um, that you could be a, a legislator and an interviewer? No, <laughs> but yes, we could. <laughs> Should I, should I be Mike Schaffler or Bill Kenimer or Tina Schaffler? Bill Kenimer, Bill Kenimer. <laughs> so um, I haven't okay. done my research. I, I met with Bill Kenimer a couple years ago, so I can pretend I'm Bill Kenimer. Okay. Um, so, very quick research. Does anybody know what Bill Kenimer is? Tell me, tell me about it. Mike <laughs> Christiani, been, he's a Republican. He's been in the legislature for many decades. He's okay. one of the more reasonable Republicans that Democrats And he runs, he's offer. running unopposed, so. Okay, yeah. running unopposed. Microphone's mm -hmm. <laughs> closed. Uh, Senator, representative? Representative. Representative. We, we have some hearing challenge people, so oh, they oh, yes. oh, yes. the mouth. Oh, yes. Um, oh, well, uh, so, thank you, uh, thank representative, representative Kenmer, I'm, I'm glad I could uh, come, that you would, uh, Allow me to come and talk to you today about uh, health care issues. And um, in particular, I'm thinking there's a bill in the 20 that we're um, hoping uh, comes forward in the 2015 session that would provide universal health care for everybody in Oregon. And I'm, I'm wondering what your your um, feeling is about this bill, and, and what do you think? Uh, it, it you know would you support this bill? Do you think it's a good idea? And, and how can we move forward? Uh, this, this Michael Delmbro submitted a couple times previous session. It, it's pretty similar, um, but it's got funding in it this time. So um, we're thinking that we're trying to make it a little bit more serious. We're thinking we would actually like to have it pass, and we would be um, thinking about setting up a tax structure so that we could actually fund the health care that this bill would provide. It's always tough to talk about new taxes. Yes, it is. Um, so we we <laughs> want to make sure that um, the there's enough taxes taxes in this system to um, to actually fund the system that we would like to have, and the we need to remember that what it's the taxes there's going to be two sorts of taxes in this. There's going to be a payroll tax, and it, on average, the payroll tax will be slightly less than what businesses are currently paying for health insurance. There will also be a personal income tax, and the personal income tax for health care will also be slightly less than what people are currently paying on average for their own um, out-of-pocket for health care, their deductibles, their premiums, their co-insurance, um, whatever else they might pay for health care. So on average, the cost will actually be a little bit less. Well, are any of the business organizations behind this? Yes. Yes, there are some business organizations that are behind this. Um, and I will have to get back to you on the particular business organizations that are behind this. Uh, Lee Mercer, who is um, um, part of Main Street Alliance, or has led Main Street Alliance, has a list of small businesses that are for this. And I will I'll get back to you on the businesses that are behind this. And what, uh, so what is this going to end up costing for, for example, I have my health insurance plan, many people have their health insurance already, uh, are they going to be paying more because they have to pay for all these health uninsured people that would be added in? So on average, people would pay less. Um, there will be people that are paying more, um, and it's, it's, we're 
devising it, designing it as a progressive tax system. So the people who would be paying more are those who are most capable of paying more. The people who would be paying less are those who are not as capable of paying more. So this would be added on through the current income tax? Yeah, it would be a dedicated personal income tax for the purpose of funding the health care plan. Uh, that would be the personal part. There would also be a dedicated payroll tax for, um, to also help fund this. And how does this affect uh, multi-state trusts in some organizations? <laughs> so, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, look at the website. We have not yet designed the, legis the legislation to know the answer to that. Um, and so that's that's the real answer currently. <laughs> um, the we don't know. Well, if we, we can we, solve we, that problem, well, we can go on. Yeah. Board. The the um, the general answer is that what this legislation does is it gives the board of directors of the um, you know it's it's a new board that's essentially um, doing a function similar to what, what's the current board that runs OHA called? Um, the Oregon, Oregon Health Policy Board. Or, Oregon Health Policy Board, but it's, it's, a, it's a board that is doing something similar, will be doing something similar to what the Oregon Health Policy Board does, and they are going to have to um, deal with federal regulations uh, to try to figure out how to include people in Medicare in this plan, to find out if they can get the uh, current waivers, to, to get the waiver for the um, Affordable Care Act so that the Oregon, um, Let me ask Oregon you, system can be in. What is the main problem you're trying to solve? The main problem we're trying to solve is that not everybody has access to good health care. So we're trying to make it universal. That's the number one problem. I, I understand that. I agree with that. I, my niece had a problem getting health care herself and, and it's something it's it's home you know because I, I know people have been in that situation I'm just trying to figure out what's the best way to solve this and I'm not convinced that your approach is the best way to solve this because maybe we could do something through the Oregon insurance uh, regulatory structure so many other well every other industrialized nation in the world has ta has tackled this problem and every other industrialized nation in the world has come up with a solution that has universal um, coverage. And uh, there's, there's a variety of methods they have done it. They have done it with, um, if, if they have continued to have private insurance companies in their system, they are highly regulated so that they all essentially have to have the same plan for basic coverage. Um, but what we're trying to build off of is what Medicare does now, where everybody over a certain age is is covered, and the system delivers healthcare privately. So we are essentially saying we're going to ex expand and improve Medicare, and the age at which you can join Medicare is birth, or you know everybody is in the system. And so it's an expansion of our current system that seems to work well in this country and has widespread support. And so we're trying to improve on that system. Well, first of all, I don't like to expand government programs. I prefer to do as much as we can through private sector. And sometimes, I know, sometimes there's a need for government services. Roads certainly work better as a government service. Schools, I think, work better as a government service. But um, convince me that there is a reason why we should have a government takeover of health care. So th this would actually not be at all a government takeover of health care. So all of the provision of health care would be pretty much left alone so that the current providers, if they're a private provider, would still be a provi private provider. Public um, hospitals would be public hospitals. So there's not a change in that. The only change is in the financing of the system. So that rather than paying insurance companies to administer a system that excludes a number of people, um, we would have a government, we would have a taxpayer finance system that would include everybody. And the reason for this is it's, it's 
can be universal, it's fair, it actually will cost us less money. So we'll be saving money by this system. Uh, there will be two places where, really three places where we save money. One big place that's going to be saving money is you're probably aware that on average in Oregon right now, about 12% of all the money that goes into health insurance is kept for administrative purposes. Uh, whereas in the um, Medicare, it's closer to about 3%. There's also a substantial amount of money that is used in every single provider's office to do the billing. For example, um, in there was a um, hospital, I think Boston, the major hospital in Boston had about 250 people involved in billing, and a similar size hospital in Canada had two people involved in billing. So it's, you save a lot of money in billing. The other place that money can be saved is in um, negotiating with pharmaceutical and um, equipment manufacturers. If you have a bigger pool to do those negotiations, you could probably get more favorable rates. So those are three places where we'll save substantial amounts of money. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that uh, savings in the billing practice of the billing work and uh, that overhead part. Um, do you have just statistics on that, calculations of how much goes into that? It's, it's actually slightly larger than the amount that you would save um, from the administrative costs within the insurance companies. So that roughly in the insurance companies, it's, uh, and it, this is in Oregon, it, it goes, it's about 12% and Medicare is about 3%, so you have to save about 9%. The private billing is a slightly larger amount than that. I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll send those to you. Would my son-in-law who works for an insurance agent uh, be thrown out of a job? He might lose a job. So there is, there is provision in this bill to um, provide retraining. So there's, and there's also provision in this bill to provide extended unemployment insurance if he does not, if he's not able to find a job within a short period of time, within the, the um, 26 weeks or whatever is current. So he can get up to, he can get more um, unemployment insurance if it takes longer to find a job or if he needs training that's gonna go over that period of time. Um, so that is likely gonna happen, some people lose jobs, but many people who are in these billing jobs would probably rather have a more productive job anyway. The average um, people who are in, in these jobs, um, you know, they, they only last about two years because they're not all that satisfying. Oh, yeah, a lot of people. Sorry, I thought I we need to get going to a committee meeting. Oh, okay. And so I'd be glad to learn more about um, the statistic and, and economic calculations if you want to send that. I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming. So we have just about five minutes in this segment, and so instead of breaking up into groups, let's get two more people up here. Uh, you want to say something first, Don? One of the things that I was taught in negotiations is that you do a tie-down. For example, he asked if the, about the taxes, and I'd say, if the taxes are less, will you vote for this? Huh. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And so then if he says, is that your, or is that your major objection, if I can handle that, are, will you vote for this? And so what you're trying to do is to get him to say yes on something and to find out what it is that will take it to get him to say yes. So that's what you're trying to find out. And his questions are leading you to think that those are the important areas. So is that enough to get you to a yes if I can answer that? What's that called again? A what? A tie down? Tie down. Oh, okay. well, it may not get taxes lower overall societal costs would be lower I'm just yes asking. but if you can answer that if, no. if is that enough for you to get the yes yeah. oh okay uh, just a quick one on that when when you were asked uh, the business about the, the effect on the trusts or whatever that thing coming from left field um, I, I think if I had been there I said I would have no idea what that effect is if that's important to you I would like to know why you asked that question, no. uh, when I understand it, I'll jot it down and I'll get back to you as soon as I can on that. Right. And is that the question keeping you from saying yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have two more people that want to get up here and the, uh, the I one... Just, I just wanted to make a comment real quick. That the one thing that Charlie didn't do in our conversation was 
right at the beginning, tell his personal reasons and story of why it's so important to him. And I think if he'd done that, it would have drawn me as a legislator in more. Um, some of the comments and questions that I made actually did come from Bill Kenham a couple years ago. Oh, when I met with him. And one of the things that was good about that meeting, though, was that when we met, we did share some personal stories about the reasons for this. He shared his own stories of why he knows it's important as well, and then what information he would like to learn more about. Okay. Um, a few things. I mean, as far as the multi-employer thing, and really uh, many of those questions, instead of getting yourself stuck in the weeds, go back to saying, you know, this is a, this is a tried and proven issue in Canada, Taiwan, all these other countries that have um, some of these countries that have higher union, unionization rates, we all know they get better results for health, public health at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to get stuck in the weeds. Come back to that talking point. Um, and a, a, a other thing in the beginning when he was saying, oh, you're back again, what I would say is, you know, what we're, our coalition has grown since we saw you last. We've done this polling that shows that the majority support health care as a human right, including Republicans, and also that um, we're, we've moved towards, uh, we've moved now to coming up with this financing study that we've paid for. So we've really come very far from last time we talked to you, and we've really progressed. I would suggest rather than using the Medicare for All analogy as an example or illustration to model our program on, to raise the Oregon Health Plan and the triple aim. Because what we're asking is essentially for an Oregon Health Plan for everybody, not just restricted to the indigents. And this is going to be something that the legislators are familiar with and perhaps even support. Uh, you know, uh, Lisa? Lisa, Lisa, you got it right here. So that question I was asked about, is this a government takeover? One response I might have and I want, want to get feedback on is that Actually, it's going to help small business because doctors consider themselves a business. And if doctors have the freedom to solicit clients from all over rather than just a certain network limited to by insurance, that would expand their marketing capability. The question often gets asked is, well, so why are we doing this kind of program or how would this work? And my one of the docs in my clinic had a perfect phrase for this. He said, you know, in all the other large industrial countries, this wheel has already been invented. We have two volunteers that will be uh, legislator and, and uh, advocate. You? I'd like to be advocate. Okay. Who wants to be the, uh, the legislator, right? Right. Lisa. Uh, Lisa. Be, be a right-wing legislator. <laughs> no. no, be be a Democrat who needs to be convinced. Yeah. 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 You need to be together. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank, um, you for, thank you for coming in to see me. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Hyung Nam. I'm a Portland Public Schools teacher and um, active with my union and involved with Healthcare for All Oregon. And um, I just want to come and um, thank you for your um, you know, support for um, Healthcare for All Oregon in the past, um, but you know, give you an update on what we're doing now and really urge you to um, not only become a, you know, not only be, continue to be a supporter, but to become an active champion of our cause and to speak about it constantly in the public. So I've been studying a lot about the information all of you have been sending me, and thank you for the updates. I do have some concerns. One being that I've studied the costs and where this money is going to come from, and I'm concerned that my constituency is going to have some real problems with the tax issue. I hear you saying that we are going to end up saving all of us money, but they're still looking at a tax increase, and that's one of my big concerns. Yeah, absolutely, and you know I know that we have so many other issues as well, and you know one being, as a public school teacher. You know, I've seen cut after cut after cut, year after year, and you, you know the horrible statistics that make Oregon look really bad to the rest of the country, right? We're in the bottom five for class size, we're in the bottom five for funding for higher education, and um, all that money is coming out of um, our public tax dollars that should be going to um, 
Well, I'm sorry, all this money um, for um, me as a public school teacher, my insurance premium is $18,000 a year, and yet I still have hundreds of dollars I have to pay out of pocket to get the health care that I need. And, um, you know, when we're um, bargaining for a contract like we did last time, the first thing they said was, um, we want to cap our um, contribution to your health care, and you're going to be responsible for all that, which basically means that it's a future pay cut for us. Um, and you know, do you think that this is sustainable for us to constantly give these raises to the insurance companies while um, class sizes suffer and um, teachers' um, wages are stagnant? I understand what you're saying. There's payoffs, and some of the payoffs are negative, and I understand you're talking about, as a former teacher, I can totally relate, having had my health care benefits take a big chunk of my paycheck. So I hear you, and I am concerned, and I am sympathetic. I do have some concerns, as I said. Another thing I would like to see personally, and again, I'm not saying I'm opposed to what you're doing, is we've heard some statistics now saying that Oregonians, less are uninsured now, and on a whole, they're paying less. I would like to see what happens with the ACA, give it a little bit of time to work, and see if we can bring more people in the state and in my district into the fold for better health care. Yeah, you know, I, I could understand how you say that. We come across that uh, um, that position often, and you know what? I think there's a lot that we could extrapolate from. First of all, we have this um, study that's coming out um, with political economist <coughs> Gerald Friedman from the University of Massachusetts that's doing the study. He's done studies for several other states as well, and so we'll have much more details about the actual financing costs of this program. But also what we know is that um, Massachusetts already has been under this program. They have 95% insurance coverage rates, which has been an improvement, but they, they um, are struggling with cutting their budget as their budget for health care costs have been going up year after year. They've been cutting from education and so many other public programs. And you know we cannot just wait to suffer under the same problems that Massachusetts is suffering under. I mean, there's a health single payer movement in Massachusetts as well because um, the model like ECA, which doesn't fix the market failure of our current system, um, is still plaguing them with problems. And we want to make sure that we avoid that and make Oregon be the leader um, in the country to really have a competitive advantage. I mean, think about how horrible it is as a Democrat for you to give away these tax subsidies to businesses because they threaten to you know, leave the state. I mean, this by itself, uh, single-payer health care will be the huge subsidy that all businesses will have. We will attract businesses to come invest in Oregon because their cost for providing health care for their employees will be so much lower in our state than other states. Right, and I hear you, and I am familiar with what happened in Massachusetts and about the horrendous, absolutely horrendous budget consequences of what happened there. It was a, it was a great thing they tried, but it's, I know people are now paying more and the state's kind of in trouble. Um, Does that mean I, you'll vote for us? <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you coming in. I appreciate hearing some of these concerns. Um, I have a few others, but I also hear what you're saying. And I would like to, you know, I'd like to see the study bill. I would really like to see some comparative costs. Again, my problem as a, as a legislator representing my people um, as a Democrat as well, is convincing them that this is going to be the most cost-effective thing. I also have people in the state, insurance people, who are going to be, you know, questioning their jobs, so we need to look at that. But um, thank you for coming, and I appreciate what you've been doing. Thank you. We, okay, we have an opportunity for two more people to come up, and we can make it easier this time. We have Gene Uphoff's ready-made answers, so one can have ready-made answers, and the other. Okay. Why don't doctors support a single payer system? Well, actually, most doctors do support it. <laughs> Over 59 of the physicians now support change into a single payer system of health care financing. And it would ensure that everyone has access to care, reduce office overhead, and guarantee coverage for medical services or drugs. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, no, you're still on. Oh. How would single payer control how would single payer control costs? Oh yes. Glad you asked. Uh, glad you asked. <laughs> Ensuring everyone will reduce expensive care for chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. Blood, I didn't know that that's you. 
Blood pressure medication at $10 a month costs less than 10 minutes in an emergency room. Reduction of paperwork required by thousands of private health plans will save each doctor $70,000 yearly in overhead. Hospital billing and overhead exceed $600 a person. That's three times that of in Canada. Elimination of profit, profits, exorbitant CEO incomes, and predatory marketing will generate $400 billion a year. Yeah, well, uh, 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 it's not like socialized medicine to me. Why, why, why should we let the government control our health care decisions? Whoa. <laughs> Our current private system lets the for-profit insurance companies decide which doctors you can see, which hospitals you can use, and which medications will be covered. Single payers is not socialized medicine, for all medical care is provided by government doctors and hospitals. Instead, it organizes the funding of health care under a single entity for financing and payment of medical services. The inclusion of all physicians and hospital will mean your choices are less restricted. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I mean, I think people should pay their own way. I'm tired of people breaking the law. So why would, would undocumented immigrants be covered, and why? Despite popular beliefs, undocumented workers in the U.S. use very little in the way of medical services, and studies have shown that they are generally healthier than U.S.-born residents. Additionally, helping to maintain their health is both administratively simpler and will allow them to continue work where they're being employed. And it would really show that we care about them. Yeah, well, this really sounds anti-American to me. I want to tell you, I, I'm getting sick of this. Because don't we have the world's best medical care system? I mean, this is the United States of America. USA. I, I know, I USA. know. I know. <laughs> America yeah. ranks 36 in the world in overhaul health outcomes, trailing countries such as Cyprus, Morocco, Portugal, and Colombia. American women have twice the risk of dying in pregnancy as women in Canada. During the first year of life, our infants die more than twice as often as Swedish babies, and Italians live more than three years longer than we do. All right, how did they do? Hey. Well, we have a few minutes uh, for questions and answers. Um, so, of all that you just witnessed, the back and forth. Um, oh, I have three minutes? Okay. Um, and the use of uh, flashcards that Gene has made for us. How do you think we can use all this information? Uh, Just a quick thing, so you know, given that we've got all this kind of information, just remember um, when we're training people that they don't have to feel overwhelmed that they have to memorize all this, that they can simply repeat our basic key point, talking points that are totally true and simple enough to communicate um, and just say, go to the website, you'll see very detailed information um, referenced and backed up and everything there. And so, you know, make our people feel confident that this is all completely backed up by the facts and just continue to repeat the basic key talking points and say, go to our website, we've got everything documented. I want to take this opportunity to guide you to where you can get all, all of the uh, printouts that you've seen uh, online and download them. So here we are at the um, the Healthcare for All Oregon website, Education, Education yeah. Fund website, mm -hmm. and uh, there's um, articles and so forth. But oh, um, up at the top is uh, our tabs, and um, one of them is Speakers Bureau. Double click on that. So go to uh, Speakers Bureau. You're there. And then down to the bottom. And I agree with him that we don't have to memorize everything that's on this, but it's a good 
uh, place to go for uh, information. So here's, um, there's what, six or seven entries there, but under references, oh no, under legislation and lobbying, click on that, and then you have uh, the bills under this uh, file and a folder, and then you have lobbyist training, and you'll see these documents, most of which you have in hand in paper form, um, like uh, planning a lobby day, preparing for a legislative visit, and so on. Uh, or this one that um, Charlie Swanson found, if the legislator is a Republican. So just yeah. so you get this uh, document downloaded and you click on it and you can take on any Republican. <laughs> well, actually, these, these are just a uh, active links. So once you pull this document up, then you can either copy and paste the links and, and get these, uh, what, what about seven, six or seven um, links that will no, help you. The only, there's only... Um, oh, there's only three or four? There's just there's two like, links about being Republican. The other one's just finding your legislators. So. Okay. I, I took that one off of this one. There's a separate one. Oh, no, it's on there. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to suggest an approach to doing this. Uh, the first thing I want to say is I think, Joan, you've added a level that we are the trainers in this room, okay? It's sort of, but I actually think maybe we should think of ourselves as the coordinators. And because, you know, I'm not sure everybody in the room feels like they would feel confident to be totally training somebody else after this session. But I, but I think what I'd like to suggest is, as I'm thinking about District 41, which is my district, we've got a group that I've got a bunch of names, but we haven't functioned as a group much, you know. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up those people and say, I want to, you know, I'm looking for some people to come and be uh, constituent lobbyists, I think is what I'm going to say, uh, and to, to, on, on, on February 11th, and would you be willing to do that and meet a couple of times to do that? And in the first session, I think the agenda would be Let's talk about what are our stories, why do we care about that, and get practiced articulating that as a, we know that's a piece of what we want to do in talking to our legislators. And then let's talk about what kinds of stuff we'd like to be able to say and know the answer to that we don't feel comfortable with yet. So if the goal of the whole project is to make the, the constituent lobbyists comfortable in going out and doing that. And there'll be some people who've done it before and a lot of people who haven't. So, so getting people comfortable, getting them to understand what they're nervous about and have an answer to that is really the goal. So, so the first session would just be practice telling own stories and figuring out what we need to find out. Mm -hmm. And then in between that and the next meeting, send questions in to the education committee, to Legislative committee to Ross, you know, wherever, have people doing their own research, or reconvene and, and then say, okay, what are the answers to the questions we asked, and let's do some role playing. So, so that's what I'm sort of envisioning. It's not a whole lot of time, but probably two sessions, and, and the aim being just to get people comfortable. And, and then, you know, the simple guidance about, you know, how do you behave when you go into the <laughs> legislator's <laughs> office, you know. It, the shorter document about that. Um, that, that that's that's a that's a, a theory I'm offering anyway. So. <laughs>